We love you for Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. First Timothy. Chapter 4. 1 through 16. First Timothy 4, 1 through 16 is where we're going to be. And this is just going to serve as an introduction to this series that we're going to be in for the next several weeks. Um, so let me read this passage to you. Now the Spirit explicitly says that in the later times, some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. They forbid marriages and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. For everyone created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished by the words of the faith and the good teaching that you follow. But have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train yourself in godliness. For the training of this body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way since it's whole promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. For this reason we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially for those of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that you may, your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Preserve, persevere in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Famed theologian A.W. Tozer said that what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about us. Theology matters. It determines how we relate to God, how we treat others, how we see the church, even what eternity looks like. Our beliefs always matter. That's why we're kicking off this series this weekend called I Believe. In the text we just read, the Apostle Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy, a young man in ministry, um, and he's encouraging him in his ministry. Paul knows Timothy. He knows his mother. He knows his grandmother. Paul knows that Timothy comes from a good family, a godly heritage. In the second letter to Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy of his heritage. He says in 2 Timothy 1, he says, I reminded you of your sincere faith, with, which first lived in your grandfather, grandmother Lois, in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. But in this first letter that Paul is writing to Timothy, he admonishes this young man. He says, watch your life. Watch your doctrine. Watch them closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you'll save yourself, and you'll save your hearers. That's got to be pretty important stuff, because Paul says Timothy will save himself and his hearers if he heeds Paul's advice. We're pretty familiar with telling each other how to watch our lives. We watch how we live as believers. One theologian described the church as a contrast society. And that he means that Christians gathered in community together live differently than the world around them. They live in contrast to the normal or accepted rules of the greater society. And Christian history overflows when our best moments we rise to the challenge of being a contrast society. In times of early persecution, Christians went to their death in arenas with the testimony of Christ on their lips. The Apostle Simon when he was faced with crucifixion, requested, he said, would you crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to be, die in the same way that Jesus died. And down through the centuries, Christians have nursed those struck down by plagues when no one else would want to care for them. Putting their own lives in danger, many Christians would rather die because they were willing to care for those who were hurting and struggling. And they gained 
admiration from government and society for generations that followed. Christians have opposed wars. They've worked for the abolition of slavery. They insisted that the hungry be fed. They have that those in poverty be lifted up. We watched our lives, both personally and collectively, as Christ's witnesses for over 2,000 years. Have there been colossal failures? There have. And we recognize them to be failures, and we admit freely that as part of our lives that we have the responsibility to repent of past sins, both individually and communally. So we're familiar with self-examination. We're familiar with examining and living our lives differently from the world. Over the first six weeks of this year, we've talked about how we're called to live differently. We've talked about that our belief in God shapes how we live our lives, that we believe that God is great, so we don't have to live trying to control our lives. We believe that God is good. We believe that God is gracious. We believe that God is glorious, and so we don't have to look for other people's approval. We don't have to um, demand stuff from other people. Our lives are different because of what God has done and because of who God is. In the last couple weeks, we've looked at what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be someone who is a follower of Jesus, what it means for a family to be followers of Jesus. But if there's anything that's lacking in the 21st century, it's the other half of Paul's admonition to Timothy to watch our doctrine, to watch it closely. In our family of faith, doctrine has become like the embarrassing uncle that no one wants to deal with. The one that we never talk about, but we're related to anyway, we can't get rid of them. So let me stop and pause real quick and say what, doc, what I mean by doctrine. What I think Paul means by doctrine. I don't mean a specific church's or denomination's doctrine. I don't think that's what Paul meant either. But I, do not, I don't mean the things that distinguish this congregation from the other churches that meet even just down the street from us. The Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or the Met Methodist church or the Pentecostal church. What I mean and what I think Paul means is when he uses this word doctrine is what are those beliefs that distinguish us from the rest of the world? From those who don't share our faith? What are those things that we believe that says the rest of the world doesn't believe this? Paul warns about two dangers for Timothy that he was warning him about. One, he said, Timothy, would you live, that I'm worried that you will not live an exemplary life, and therefore that you will lose your effectiveness as a young preacher. Timothy, you could easily get swayed and distracted, and then your life will not point to Jesus. So Paul tells him, watch your life, how you live, what you do, the actions you take, the behaviors you engage in. This is why in verse 12 he says, Don't let anyone despise your youth. Set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. But secondly, Paul is also concerned that Timothy would get blown off by every wind of doctrine, by old wives' tales and false teaching. And so he writes in verses 1 and 2, The Spirit explicitly says in the latter days, Some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences so seared. So when Paul is writing this to Timothy, the church is about 30 years old, and there are already some challenges that the apostles are facing. The Judaizers are coming and saying to non-Jews that the way that you become a follower of Jesus is by practicing certain customs and traditions. And Paul addresses that by writing the book of Galatians and says, we're saved by grace and faith and faith alone. The Gnostics show up, and they say that Jesus only appeared to have a body, but he really didn't have a body, and so um, he's not really like us. And the Apostle John addresses that heresy in 1 John, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. And so oftentimes we talk about, oh, we need to be like the first century church, but friends, the first century church was just like us. They were facing challenges. They were facing false teachings, they were facing false doctrines, they were facing divisions in the church right from the beginning. They, they were not going in the same direction at the same time. It was a time of intense challenge to the very heart of the good news. What does that have to do with us 20 centuries later? Even today, the church is under assault by similar forces. In the face of secularism and pluralism and nominalism and materialism, and criticism, and postmodernism, and atheism. How do we say that this word is true? How do we believe this word is true? 
So in dealing with those challenges, we're going to be on a journey the next several weeks about talking about how to watch our doctrine. And as we, as our outline for this look at Christian doctrine, we're going to be using something called the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to read it to you real quick. Um, I believe we have the Apostles' Creed back there, but let me read it to you so you hear it. If you're familiar with it, you can read it with me. But it says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Now, I know some of you in this room are caught up with that word Catholic. And so let me quickly clarify that word Catholic basically means the universal church. It is that we are part of one body of Christ. That the church in India, the church in the Middle East, and the church in the U.S., we are part of one body. And so don't get caught up in that one word right there. We're not changing denominations here. So the early church used this creed as a teaching tool, almost like a catechism or Sunday school curriculum. The kids were taught to believe this. They used this creed as a way to identify heresies and false teachings. It was even used as a, in the early church as a baptism test. They would use this to say, do you believe this? If you believe this, then we're going to baptize you. Now churches generally take one of two positions when it comes to the creed. Either they'll recite this a lot, you'll, uh, you'll hear this said often, or you'll never hear it at all. Now, Loft has been in that second group. We have never recited the creed till like last week. And so, um, but there are many, many churches where the creed is a regular feature of their worship service. Some of you grew up in churches where you're used to saying the creeds often. Maybe Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopal, Catholic churches say the creed almost every Sunday, if not every Sunday. Others of us grew up in faith traditions where this was not a part of our services. There might be some of you in this room that until last week, you had no idea what the Apostles' Creed was, right? See, if we don't, if we're not the group that recites the Creed, then why are we studying it? There's some good answers for that. Hopefully, there are good answers for that. Uh, number one, it's the oldest and most widely accepted Creed. It's recognized by all branches of Christianity, whether it's Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox, all of them have accepted this as basic doctrine. For 3,000 years, the Creed has served as a statement of the incredible minimum, irreducible minimum of the Christian faith. It is the common heritage of the Christian church. Second, it's the broad survey of Christian doctrine. It starts with creation and ends with eternal life. That's about as broad as you get. And you'll see it's not comprehensive, but everything it covers is important. And third, and I think while we're studying it is it offers a radical challenge to the skepticism of this generation. The people of the world doubt that we can be certain about anything. I'm not sure serves as the motto of our generation. And over against that uncertainty, we have those first two words of the creed that says, I believe. If we have no other reason to study this, that will be good enough. The creed forces us to say, I believe. This is what I believe. If you remember in our study back in Ruth, when we were doing in November, we talked about how Ruth lived in a times of the judges. And what defined the times of the judges was this verse. It said, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did whatever was fitting for them. There was no king to rule over them. And it would be hard to find a more fitting description of modern American life. If you ask people on the street what they believe, you receive a bewildering array of answers. And that leads us to a vital truth as we begin this series. Our faith is a doctrinal faith. It's not a buffet where you can go in and you can say, man, I like this, but I really don't like this, so I'm going to pick this, I'm going to choose this, I'm going to accept this, but I'm going to reject that. That's not our faith. 
we must not be people that say, you know what, as long as you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter what else we believe. Because unless the Jesus we believe is the Jesus of Scripture, then that's not the real Jesus. That means Christianity is more than just a conversion experience. To be a Christian means that you and I are called to learn the doctrines of Scripture. This doesn't come naturally to us. This is why the Apostles' Creed is important in the history of the church. Friends, truth is not up for grabs. And it's not decided by what we feel or by a majority vote or the latest opinion poll or how culture has changed and we must change with the culture. That is not our faith. Our faith has been passed down to us for 2,000 years and men and women have died for this and it would be a dishonor to them for us to say, you know what, it was great, you believed it, we're not going to believe that. They gave their lives so that you and I can know this truth. So I think the creeds are important for us. And we need it in our own lives and we need it in our congregation. We need the creed because it's the oldest expression currently in use of the beliefs that we hold in common as Christians. We need the creeds because it helps us connect to the church of the first century and to the faith of the apostles themselves. We need the creeds because it, to humble us, to remind us that we're not the first generation to follow Jesus, that we don't get a new idea about Jesus, that um, we don't get this new theology that we now follow, that there's a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, who have handed that faith off to our generation, and now we get the joy of holding true to that doctrine and handing it off to our next generation. We need the creed as a clear expression of what we believe when we're called to give account of our faith. We need the creed to remind us of the whole counsel of God. We need the creed to remind us of the uniqueness of Jesus. We need the creed to remind us that the Holy Spirit is still with us. We need the creed to remind us that we do indeed believe in the church, in an age when the church is being attacked and ignored. We need the creed to draw us into a new appreciation of what it means to be in communion with the saints, to make us thankful for the forgiveness of the sins and to remind us there is indeed life everlasting. Most of all, we need the creed as a brief expression of our faith. The creed is short enough, it's only 109 words, to commit to memory in just a few times reciting it. So I'm hoping by the time we're done with this series, you guys will have this memorized. It's broad enough to join us to the Christian, greater Christian family that transcends denomination divisions, denominational divisions. So as I'm preaching on the creed for a number of weeks, it is important for you to know that we don't base our faith on any creed or any statement of faith. Our ultimate source of authority is the written word of God. Because it is inspired by God, the word is true in all of its part and entirely trustworthy. And let me say that that is where we are coming from as we begin this series. We are not questioning whether the Bible is true or not. We are coming from the perspective that this word is true from beginning to end, and there is no, there is no second guessing that. That is where we come from. No creed can make that claim for itself. Think about it this way. First of all, there is God who gives us this word. And from the word comes the creeds and confessions of the church. The church believes the creeds and confessions because they reflect what God has said in this word. That doesn't mean that everything found in every creed or confession is correct. But it does mean that the creeds and confessions of faith are helpful as long as they reflect what the word of God actually says. And so these sermons are ultimately based on the biblical teaching that underlies each of these statements. If you're still tracking with me, you may wonder, what does all of this have to do with me? Good question. After all, we live in a practical age where people want to know how truth impacts them personally. The answer is found in those first two words of the creed. I believe. I believe. That's a powerful assertion. It's not the same as saying, I know, or I think, or I feel. To say I believe means that you are making a personal commitment to that truth. 
Romans 1, 16 declares that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Romans 10, 9 adds that the concept of believing in your heart, which means to believe from the depths of your being. Salvation depends on what we believe. That's why the Gospel of John, which we study for over two years, over 80 times, says that salvation comes to those who believe. In a deep sense, you are what you believe. So are you behavior. Where do your actions come from? From your feelings. Where do your feelings come from? From your attitudes. Where do your attitudes come from? From your values. Where do your values come from? From your beliefs. Trace it back far enough and it always comes back to the same place. You are what you believe. Think about this for a further thought. What you believe determines your eternal destiny. You know the worst. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will have a eternal life. Your eternal destiny depends on whether or not you believe Jesus with all your heart. Let's pause for a second to look at that word believe. And that, word, you know, that word believe in the Greek means to believe into something or believe in someone. In English, the word believe has different meanings. If I say, hey, I believe it's going to rain tomorrow, that's nothing more than a hunch, especially in Texas. It might snow tomorrow. Um, if, I believe, if I say, I believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States, that, that refers to settled historical fact. Some of you say this all the time. In August, September, I believe the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl this year. And then come December, you say, I believe they're going to win next year, right? Um, that's just stupidity. Um, but, but to say, I believe with Jesus with all my heart is a different sort of statement altogether. Let me illustrate. Suppose I go to a doctor and he says to me, hey, Sam, I'm sorry, you've got cancer and it's life threatening. I've got chemotherapy that can cure the cancer. But it's going to be very difficult to take, and it's going to make you sick. If you're willing to take it, you're willing to get cured of your cancer. In that case, to say that I believe in my doctor means something very specific. It doesn't mean, man, I really believe he's a doctor. It doesn't mean, man, I believe he's right when he says that I have cancer. It doesn't mean I believe that chemotherapy can even cure me. I don't truly believe in your doctor until I roll up the sleeve and say, all right, give me the medication I need so that I can be cured. To believe in the doctor means to completely trust myself into his care, to accept his diagnosis, and to put my life into his hands and say, even if this hurts me, I trust in you, this is for my good. Believing in Jesus means to trust him completely with your eternal destiny. It means to trust Christ so completely that if he can't take you to heaven, you're not going to go there. In the ninth century, there was a great tightrope walker by the name of Charles Blondin. On June 30th, 1859, he became the first man in history to walk across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. He must have had nothing better to do back then. Um, over 25,000 people gathered to watch him walk 1,100 feet on a suspended tiny rope 160 feet above the raging waters. He worked without a net or a safety harness of any kind. For you guys at rock climbing, you guys would never do this. The slightest slip would prove fatal to him. And when he reached safely from the U.S. side to the Canadian side, the crowds erupted into this loud roar and cheer. In the following days, he would walk across the falls many, many times. Once he walked across it on stilts. Another time, he took a chair and a little mini stove, and he sat down midway through and cooked an omelet, and he ate it. Charles, you probably could verify if this is true or not. He was there. Um, <laughs> once he carried his manager riding piggyback across the Niagara Falls. And once he pushed a wheelbarrow across loaded with 350 pounds of cement. And once he, one time he, after the crowd settled down, he said, hey, do you, any of you believe that I could push a man across in a wheelbarrow? And a loud roar of approval from the crowd. Everyone's cheering and everyone's saying yes. 
They saw this guy standing there. He's like, sir, do you believe that I can push a man across in the wheelbarrow? And he's like, absolutely. Yes, you can. He's like, all right, come on, get in. <laughs> and the man refused. It's one thing to believe a man can walk across by himself. It's another thing to believe that he can safely carry you across. But it's something completely entirely different to get into that wheelbarrow yourself and to trust that he will take you across. Friends, believing Jesus is like getting into that wheelbarrow. It's just trusting that all you are is all that he is. The believing that changes the life and connects to God is best conveyed in the word trust. You've heard me use this illustration before. Tim Keller uses this, but imagine you're on a high cliff and you lose your footing and you begin to fall. Just beside you as you are falling, there is a branch sticking out at the very edge of the cliff. It is your only hope and it's more than strong enough to support your weight. How does this save you? If, you find, if your mind is filled with intellectual certainty that the branch can support you, but you never actually reach out and grab it, you're lost. But if your mind is filled with doubt and uncertainty that the branch can hold you, but you still reach out and you grab it, anyway, you'll be saved. Why? Because it's not the strength of your faith, but it's the object of your faith that will actually save you. Strong faith in a weak branch is actually inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. It's not a matter of how much you believe, it's whether or not you are believing Jesus Christ to save you. In 2 Timothy 1, Paul says, I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. He doesn't say, I know what I believed, though that could be true. He doesn't say, I know how much I have believed, even though that could be true. He doesn't even say, I know when I believed, which he well could have said. He doesn't say, I know about whom I believed, which would have been perfectly appropriate. He says, I know the person into whose hands, into whose hands I have committed my present condition and my eternal destiny. I know who he is, and I therefore, without any hesitation, leave myself in his hands. It is the beginning of spiritual life to believe in Jesus. So, if you're trying to keep your own soul, you're going to be in serious trouble, and you'll be rudely surprised one day. You cannot keep yourself safe. Your only hope is to trust all that you are, all that you have, to Jesus. To lay at his feet, and you will be safe. One final word, even that verse too much. The Apostle Creed begins with these words, I believe. I believe. He doesn't say, we believe. Because the answer is simple. True belief is always going to be personal. Someone else can't give you their faith. My kids can hear of my faith, but there will be a day where they have to take this faith and say, This is mine. This is what they believe. Friends, if you're a Christian here simply because, and I've just been in church my entire life, but you've never owned your faith, can I invite you today, let this be the day that you say, this is my faith. This is my belief. I can't believe for you. You can't believe for me. No wife can believe for her husband, and no husband can believe for a wife. No parent can believe for their children. You've got to make up your own mind. You can't live on the faith of others. You can't ride on the spiritual life of other people. There's got, a day where, there's got to be a day where you say, this is my faith, this is my conviction, this is my belief. I believe that this is true of me. The church is more than just a gathering of people or a collection of Christians that is part 
the church as a community of believers who have gathered together among a common faith in Jesus. That is who we are. That's why for 2,000 years the church has affirmed the Apostles' Creed. It expresses our common faith in Christ. True belief is utterly personal. The creeds begin with those simple words, I believe. No one can sit on a fence forever. No one can simply say, hey, this is what they believe, but I'm just going to go along for the ride. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Have you given your life to Jesus? A Christian is a person who truly believes in Jesus. The charity hangs on the answer. This morning, we're, as we begin this series, and my prayer is that your hearts would be open to hearing the convictions of our faith, and that as you hear this, you would be drawn to Jesus, who is the one who gave his life for you, to redeem you to save you. But when you truly grasp that, you wouldn't sit there and argue and say, man, Jesus, I like this and I like that. But you would come to the point of saying, man, Jesus, you gave your life to me. Whatever you teach in your word, I want to obey. I want to follow. Because you were willing to lay your life for me. I surrender. Can I invite you into that journey? That we would be people who have surrendered to the God of the Bible. Not to the God of our picking and our treason, but to the God of Scripture. That we would be people that say, this is our thing. That we believe in God. And that we be people who live that out and it's reflective in how we walk our lives and live our lives to Jesus. <clears throat> We're about to start with communion. Communion is a reminder that the only reason we can believe this, the only reason this is true, the only reason this is true for us, is because Jesus gave his life to us. That his body was broken. His blood was spilled. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it wasn't based on anything we've done. It was simply in His goodness and kindness to save us from being lost. And made us part of the family, the church, the body. And if you're doubting this morning, I'm glad you're here. Can I say that? I'm so glad you're here. And I pray that during this season, as we go through this, that this will clarify your beliefs and clarify. Maybe misunderstandings about Christianity or uh, will help you really see the God of the Bible and how amazing and wonderful he is. And so, we're excited about this journey. We're about to start this. As you come to communion this morning, would you spend some time in prayer before Jesus? He said in your heart, your attitude, your affections, your desires. And when you come, would you come just worshiping him for all that he's done for you?